Israel, bring Israel into modern existence, one of the first things they did before it even became a nation, in, in one of their, uh, you, uh, one of their uh, statements is that it, Jerusalem is not the capital of Israel. In fact, they believe that Jerusalem shouldn't even be one city. And they established that right away in, in their uh, uh, UN document, I think it's 181, the, uh, the partition of the land. Jerusalem can't even be a single city. Jerusalem can't be the capital of Israel. Jerusalem uh, has nothing to do with the Jewish state. Now, in other words, for the, ever since 1948, which is 70 years, the world is in the grip of at least one major flat out lie. Then I want to talk about this. It's not just any old lie. There's a lot of lies, aren't there? But this is a huge lie in the sense that it's in direct opposition to what the Creator says. The God of the Bible, I mean, you don't even have to be literate to know Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, and it's the city of David, and it's the city where our Lord was crucified and where Satan was dealt his greatest blow, and has one very familiar psalm to all of you says, it's the city of the great king, the joy of the whole earth, amen? amen. And that is the truth, but the whole world, including the United States, has absolutely embraced a huge lie and not not just any lie, a lie in the face of the Creator. That's why what happened this week is big. Even in its immediate context, Trump got up and said that one or two days after the UN, 151 nations in the UN voted to reassert that lie. Jerusalem has nothing to do with Israel. 151 nations voted to reassert that lie. Donald Trump stood up the next day at, shortly after taking us out of UNESCO and defunding UNESCO, thank God, that clown show, and said, Jerusalem's the capital of Israel. Okay, now, one little truth can topple a castle built on lies. You realize that? That's what brought down the Soviet Union. People just started telling the truth. They'd been trained and brainwashed and trained and brainwashed and intimidated, and even our State Department utterly intimidated into repeating the truth. The Soviet Union is on the same par as the U.S. We are all morally equivalent. We're all the same. We all want the same thing. These lies put millions of people in bondage, destroyed millions of lives. There is a book called the Black Book of Communists that tried to, communism that tried to tally the death toll of communism, the idea that it should have any credibility. Yeah, you go down to the University of Iowa, <laughs> you'd think it was the latest fad. And then this lie, which is even more direct. The creator of the universe is Jerusalem, the capital of Israel. The United States government, the UN, 151 nations in the world, the US State Department, all denies it. Now, now, I want you to think about just some of the implications of that. See, because we're Christians. We're about the truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth will what? <laughs> Set you free. But if the truth sets you free, what does a lie do? Puts you in bondage. Corrupts you. The truth sanctifies you. Lies corrupt you. All of our foreign policy regarding the Middle East was based on that lie. There is one section of government that is adamantly against Israel, and that is the State Department. It was infiltrated from the beginning by pro-Arabist, pro-Muslim, pro-oil characters. And basically what you saw Trump attempting to do, I don't know if they'll succeed, is resting away from the State Department. Our foreign policy toward our most important ally. See, that's another thing I want to emphasize. I'm not being uh, political or jingoistic when I say Trump did an awesome thing, and furthermore, our most important ally is Israel. I'm not even, I, I, look, I'm not even exaggerating. Our most important ally is Israel, and here's why. Genesis 12, 3, God has a foreign policy statement. I will bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you. Another thing that I think Trump actually is, is, is being used by God to do, 
is to break the long curse, especially intensified under the Obama administration. One of the first things that Obama did as president is went right to the Arab world and told the whole Arab world that Israel has no claim on Jerusalem. He told one out of seven people in the world that their dubious claim on the most important city of the world. I, I don't emphasize that enough. Jerusalem is the most important city in the world. There's no question about it. Its importance is in this. God said, I have put my name there forever. And he has. When God says he puts his name there, someone says, Pastor Bill, what that means? I could spend the rest of my career telling you what that means and not even plumb the depths of it. But even if you don't know what it means, when you consider who said it, God, I put my name there forever. Obama and the UN and the State Department and 151 world leaders said, no, that has nothing to do with Israel. That has nothing to do with God. Basically, by taking away Jerusalem, they stripped the legitimacy of Israel. Israel, it, 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 de facto, is like a refugee camp in the Middle East, a place they don't even belong, as long as everyone held that lie. That's a powerful lie. And it hobbled us as a country to appeasing terror groups, giving legitimacy to blood-stained cretins like Yasser Arafat, a man who couldn't scrub the blood out of his hands. He's treated like a world leader. Oh, and the world leaders reacted. Anyone ever heard of Desmond Tutu? Desmond Tutu is a leading clergyman in South Africa. He's a black man, and he's credited with being part, down with the struggle with Mandela to get rid of apartheid. And he's actually a hypocrite, a liar, and an antichrist. But he's regarded as a man of God. For example, when I was in South Africa one time, he went on TV to make lascivious jokes about the Virgin Mary on TV around Christmas. Isn't that nice? But he said of what, what Trump did, heaven is weeping right now. He, he, he wouldn't know heaven if it hit him in between the eyes. He's actually on his way to hell. He's destroyed many people. The Pope prayed publicly that the status quo would remain. As soon as I heard the Pope say that, I thought, thank you, God, I know it's not going to stay as status quo. Because almost anything the Pope says, the opposite's true. But the Pope didn't stop there. He's cultivated a friendship with Mahmoud Abbas, another world leader, the protege of Yasser Arafat, the man, the man who planned and financed the slaughter of the Olympic team in 1972 of Israel. He's regarded as a world leader, a man who recently called for jihad in Jerusalem by saying, we welcome every drop of blood shed in Jerusalem. That's the Pope's buddy. Pope took him under his wing. Actually offered to make him, give him an award called the Angel of Peace Award. This is evil. So he says, you making this up, Pastor? I couldn't make it up. Because if I wrote a story like this, I'd go, no, no one would believe that. Are you kidding? You can't make this stuff up. What did the Pope do after Trump made his statement? He brought Abbas in to the Vatican and said, we're going to open up an embassy for the Palestinian state. And they raised together the Palestinian flag. He's the Antichrist. What would you expect of a man that said homosexuals can go to heaven? You don't even have to believe in God to go to heaven. Atheists can get to heaven. Of course. 151 uh, leaders of the UN had a revote shortly after Trump made a statement and re reasserted this idea. Jerusalem has nothing to do with Israel. <laughs> it's a lie. It's a manifest lie. In other words, 151 world leaders doubled down on the lie. Very few followed Trump example. One world leader that did is Duarte of the Philippines because he's in a life and death struggle, struggle with Islamic terror. So he gets it. Czechoslovakia, get, or Czech, the Czech Republic got it. Praise God for the Bohemians, amen? <laughs> 
We always come along. <laughs> uh, but this is huge and historic. And most important of all, it's prophetic. Once again, Jerusalem commands the headlines of the world. I will make Jerusalem, God said, a cup of trembling to all the nations round about when they shall be in siege against Jerusalem and Judah. I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone. Uh, the picture is the whole world, the kings of the earth are on the yellow brick road and right around the corner from their godless utopia. Only there's a big obstacle, Jerusalem. And he said, whoever picks up that stone, it literally says, Zechariah chapter 12, will be lacerated, cut to the bone. Now, I don't know what's going to happen with America. I don't know what's going to happen with Trump. I don't know very much of what's going to happen except what God revealed in the Bible, that the whole world is going to be fixated on the city of Jerusalem. And the world would ask, why? Why do we have to have this? Because it's God. You'd want anything but that. There's nothing significant there for the world and the worldly values. Jerusalem's not a big power center. It's not a big financial center. It's not a huge manufacturing center. There's the natural resources are scarce. But yet, this is the Lord. It is the city, remember, where our Lord was crucified. It is the city where God put his name. It is the city where Satan was dealt a fatal blow. It is the very piece of real estate that God predicted 2,500 years ago through the prophet Zechariah, chapter 14. His feet shall land on the Mount of Olives. The, sit, the world will make a siege against her. In fact, I hate to say it, the world will overrun Jerusalem one day. Savages will overrun Jerusalem. The pro, a pro, prophecy to Jerusalem in Zechariah 14 says, look, your, your spoil is going to be divided in your streets. Your houses are going to be robbed. Your women are going to be raped. And the, the, the forces that have besieged you will overrun you. But then the Lord will rise up off his throne and come back and his feet shall land on the Mount of Olives. What is going to bring Jesus back physically to this earth is the siege of Jerusalem, the hatred of the world expressed against this place. And now, believe me, hatred against Donald Trump as if he wasn't already hated and hatred against anyone identified with him. For never forget that their hatred against that man is for the most part hatred against you and me and middle America, okay? Hardworking, still God-fearing tax. I'm not saying Donald is, although I gotta give him credit. It takes courage. We've had a lot of good presidents like Reagan. Reagan never did that. We've had a lot of great presidents. But this man stood up in the face of all these political whores, these, these, these harlots, these, these sons of perdition, and just told it like it was. Go to Second John again. Second John, I read a scripture last week. I want to just elaborate on this. Second John, let me read the whole thing because it's just a short letter anyway, 13 verses. The elder unto the elect lady and her children whom I love in the truth. And not I only, but all they that have known the truth. <coughs> For the truth's sake, which dwells in us and shall be with us forever. Notice how many times he repeats the word, the truth. That's an important word, the truth. One, one person in history that in the gospel went down in history for this question, what is truth? And he was asking Jesus, what is truth? Well, that's a great question. I mean, I don't know if he meant it or I don't know what that was all about, but that is a great question. What is truth? 
But truth is not just abstract and vague. The Bible talks about truth, it's talking about reality according to God, which is the only one that counts. Reality according to God. There's some things, there's a lot of answers that science can't give anyone. There's a lot of amazing things science has done, but they can't answer the big questions. Like, why are we here? What's it all about? You wouldn't get an answer to those questions. Even if you went down to every library in the world and downloaded every, every bit of information, you couldn't find the answer to that. The only way you could get an answer from that is if your creator gave a revelation. See? You need a revelation from outside of here to tell us why we're here. Now we have that. I mean, we've got this beautiful book. Man is made in the image of God. He was made to know God. See, that's truth. It's revelation. The big questions. Truth is specific. It's not broad. John was dealing with Gnostics, as I told you earlier, who just make everything so broad that it doesn't have any meaning anymore. Here's the truth. But he keeps talking about the truth. It's not broad, it's specific. Who are we? Why are we here? Here's one. What comes after this life? How would you ever know? You'd need a revelation from God. That's the gospel God has revealed. God has come from heaven, become a man, came in here, give us a revelation. As it says in 1 John 5, the Son of God has come and given us un understanding. There is a life after this life. There's a judgment day. Everyone's going to give an account of everything. It's all part of the truth. How can I be saved? You'd need a revelation. We all work out plans of salvation. That's what it means to be a human being. Even if you're an atheist, you're working out a plan of salvation. Every human being on earth works out a plan of salvation. They may, most of them are wrong, but God put eternity in our hearts. We kind of know that we need to work out a plan of salvation. Atheists say, my plan is this. I'm going to die, I'm going to go into the ground, and that's going to be the end of it. Well, that's your plan of salvation. You're a man made in the image of God. You've got eternity in your heart, and you worked out what you're going to do about the next life. You're just going to will it away. Praise God, that's your plan of salvation. Mine was my good deeds will outweigh my bad. That was the plan of salvation, too. Here's the problem with most plans of salvation. Almost 99.9% .9 of them are wrong. There is a revelation from God about how to be saved. How would we know unless God showed us? God has sent his son. He says, I'm so glad my children walk in the truth. Verse 3, grace and peace with you. Mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly that I find my, thy children walking in truth. What's it mean to walk in truth? It means to stay in the truth. Remain in it, grow in it, nourish yourself on it, share it, as the Spirit was telling us through prophecy, share the truth. God showed me something. <laughs> He showed me why Jesus died. I got a revelation from God. I've spent the rest of my life sharing that. It's so big. He says, now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love that we walk after his commandments. And this is the commandment, that as you've heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. For many deceivers, oh boy, here's a warning. Many deceivers are entered into the world. And that's the truth. They don't confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. We're going to talk about that. 
when what it literally says, and when you look at the Greek, they do not confess that Jesus Christ has come and remains in the flesh. At the right hand of God sits a man with hands and feet and scars. He sits there at the right hand of God. On judgment day, the whole world will be summoned up before God, right? Yes, they will be summoned up before God, but that God will be a man. What? So beautiful, though. Like we sing in our song. He walked where I walked. He stood where I stand. He knows my frailty. Why? He shared my humanity. And what? Tempted? In every way? Who? God. Why did God become a man? He came down. Entered into our world. Fully experienced our reality. This is the core of the faith. How do you know that, Pastor Bill? A revelation from God. He showed the apostles. By his spirit, he'll show anyone to take the apostles seriously. You couldn't know any other way. A person hanging on a cross between heaven and earth with a crown of thorns on his head and derelicted of all his friends and lovers, completely abandoned. How completely? Even abandoned of God himself? They looked at him and said, man, is that guy ever a curse of God? And they were right, but half right. You'd need a revelation to know the whole story. Isaiah gives us one. He's a prophet. What do prophets do? They get revelations from God and pass them into the earth. Isaiah fills in the gap. You can, humanly speaking, look at that man, derelicted of all his friends, jeered at by his enemies, helpless before his mockers, derelicted, alone. Is man, I don't know what he did, but man, is he cursed of God. And Isaiah, 700 years before, in the 53rd chapter says, we thought he was smitten and afflicted of God. But then here comes the revelation. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement that brought us peace with God <laughs> fell on him. He says, kings will hear what they never even thought of before. It'll shut their mouths when they hear about it. It's stunning. It's amazing. Are you kidding? God came from heaven and took our place in judgment and died the death of a cursed man because I'm accursed. <laughs> Christ has redeemed us for the curse of the law, Paul said. Because it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. We were the cursed ones. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement that brought us peace came upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Amen. How would you ever know that? Revelation from God. That's the only way you could know. It's called the truth. You got to stay with it. Everything in the world will try and take you away from it. He says, I beseech you, lady, verse 5. Was he writing to a lady? No, he's writing to a church. And a church being a spiritual body as a feminine identity. To the elect lady. Dear lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that as you heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. Many deceivers have entered into the world who do not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh and remains. 
This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourself that you lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whoever transgresses and will not remain in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He that remains in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. Back in the early church, the churches were in houses and itinerant ministers went from place to place. He said, test him on this. If you don't have the doctrine of Christ, don't even t let him in. Just tell him to get, keep moving. Because it's dangerous. Notice what he says. If you, don't, if you don't remain in the doctrine of Christ, you don't have God. Okay. You don't have God. I had someone tell me, well, you're, you're, you're a Christianity. That's your version. There's a lot of versions of Christianity. As if it's just such a broad subject that, you know, anyone that wants to put a label. Now, that is the day age we're living in now. Anyone that wants to put a Christian label on anything. There's all kinds of Christians now these days. Yes, but no, it's not my version. It's a subscription to a specific doctrine. A commitment to a body of truth. We believe in God, the Father, the Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only son, born of a virgin. Right? That's the doctrine of Christ. What's he say? You've got to stay in the doctrine of Christ. Now, he's not talking about the general teaching of Christ either. People say, what did Christ teach? Oh, everyone almost has the same line. He just taught love. I know the teaching of Christ is love. All you've got to do is love one another. That's the teaching of Christ. You know, Christ actually taught very little about love. He taught about a lot of things. But a little bit of it was about love. Then why is love so associated with Christ? Because it's so powerful that God left heaven and came to the earth to die for us. <laughs> you can't unstick love from Christ. This is love. And when you believe the doctrine that it's supposed to change you so much that you'll be a lot more forbearing with everyone else around you. If you've been forgiven so much that you couldn't hold the sin against anyone else because you know what you were forgiven of, right? Yeah. So love is, saturates the thing. But when you think about it orally, you talk very little about love. Oh, Christ was positive. Everywhere he went, he was positive. It was really positive mental attitude. Christ taught more on hell than heaven. Now, why would you have to teach more on hell than heaven? If God came to earth and looked at humanity and said, man, here's, the, here's my curriculum. I'm going to have to teach them more on hell than heaven. Wait, that's not too positive. Why would you have to teach more on hell than heaven? Because the people you came to reach are already well on their way there. Almost universally. And positive visions just might not necessarily motivate them. So you taught them more on hell than heaven. But I digress because when he says the doctrine of Christ, he's not even talking about the teaching of Christ. This verse is not talking about the general teaching of Christ, the Sermon on the Mount and hell and heaven and forgiveness and love and all that. No, that's not what he's talking about. This is talking about the revelation of who Christ is specifically. He's saying if you don't stay there, I knew a guy that was a born-again Christian. He became a Christian in uh, the late 1970s when hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people were becoming Christian. He's one of the nicest guys I know. He was a sharp guy. He was reading the Bible all the time. We were all going to this church together. It turned out it was a dubious church. They said, what a fine-looking young man. They had a counseling ministry. What a fine, well-spoken young man. So, young man, you want to be a counselor? Put him in counseling. <laughs> He got so burnt out that one day he's really down and discouraged. I mean, here he is, a single young man. He's counseling married couples. He's, these fools put him in counseling. 
They disobeyed the scripture, by the way. He says, don't put a new convert in anything because he'll fall after the condemnation of the devil. If you promote him upon his means, he'll get proud. He's so vexed and confused to get alienated from the church. One day, Jehovah's Witnesses came to the door and he joined the Jehovah's Witnesses. The Jehovah's Witnesses is not just another denomination. The Jehovah's Witnesses adamantly insist that Jesus is not God. In other words, you can't be saved if you're a Jehovah's Witness. It's impossible. So it's all, but they got such good families and they're so happy and nice and well-adjusted. They're so zealous, they go out and preach. Those kind of comparisons are meaningless. Why can't we be like the Jehovah's Witnesses? I don't want to be like the Jehovah's Witnesses. They're in the spirit of Antichrist. They have, they have left the doctrine of Christ. Mormons, the same thing. You can't be a Mormon and go to heaven. Oh, but there's Mormon family. I know they're the greatest people I've ever met. And so moral and upright. And they're always quoting scripture too. Yeah, but in the most important truth, the most important doctrine is who Christ is. And Mormons say Christ is the half-brother of Satan, spirit brothers. Each came up with a plan of salvation. God chose Christ and not Satan. And Christ is, uh, was a man that's becoming a God, just like Adam was a man. Became. You can't. You, <laughs> Mormonism is the very lie that the serpent taught in the garden. You can't go to heaven. They won't remain in the doctrine of Christ. See, the point I want to make today is that this isn't just talking about the general teaching of Christ. This is talking about the, the, the revelation from God himself as to who Jesus Christ is. Go to 1 John 1. <laughs> Now, we uh, have all these creeds and everything that have developed, and I think, they're, I think creeds are good things. I understand why creeds develop. You guys probably know the Apostles' Creed, right? I, all my life, when I was a kid, I said it so much, I could say it to this day. We believe in God the Father, the Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth. And Jesus Christ, His only Son, who was born our Lord, of the Virgin Mary, crucified under Pontius Pilate, suffered, died, and was buried. We believe in the Holy Spirit. Believe in the Holy Catholic Church. Some say, oh, pastors can turn Catholic. No. Catholic means universal. I'm going to tell you a secret. We're the real Catholics. <laughs> because everywhere I've gone in the world, no matter what language, culture, tongue, I've met spirit filled Christians just like you. The same love the same hospitality, the same joy, the same belief. We're the true Catholics. After all, Roman Catholic is an oxymoron. Rome is a specific location. Catholic means everywhere. You mean you're a specific location everywhere? Doesn't make sense. We're the Catholics. Don't tell anyone. I'll be in big trouble. <laughs> every church, every Christian in the early church, could, they talked about themselves as Catholics. We're all Catholics. True Christians. Now, 1 John 1, he says, oh yeah, I was talking about creeds. You know what the earliest Christian creed was? Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Now, one of the greatest verses in the Bible, I think you should memorize this verse and use it to go and share the gospel with other people, is Romans chapter 10, 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So you know the earliest creed, the earliest Christian confession? Jesus is Lord. Let me stop there and go, go on a few sidelines for a minute. There's so much more in that than it looks like. What are you saying when you're saying Jesus is Lord? Remember, the early church had a Bible before there was a New Testament. The Bi their Bible was the Old Testament, and that's our Bible too, by the way. Isaiah says, look unto me and be saved, saith the Lord. 
For I am God and there is no other. There's no Savior besides me. As I live, saith the Lord, every knee will bow and every tongue will swear to me, the Lord. And then along come the New Testament revelation. You know that Lord in Isaiah? That carpenter from Nazareth, crucified in shame outside of Jerusalem on Calvary. He's the Lord. Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Someone says, well, anyone can say Jesus is Lord. No. Not, if, not mean it. In fact, the Bible says no one can say Jesus is Lord unless the Holy Spirit shows him. It takes a revelation from God. How would you know the carpenter of Nazareth is, is God? <laughs> It's a revelation from God. <laughs> that guy hanging between heaven and earth, derelicted. God. See, in the early church, they had a problem, and I think that problem's coming back. It's an early version of the mark of the beast. There's a marketplace in the city of Ephesus, a ruin, but a, a, there's still a plaque over it that says, you cannot participate in any of this merchandise without a certificate, a libel, libelous is what they called it. What did the certificate say? This person has taken a pinch of incense at the appointed time, on the appointed day of the calendar, put it in a fire and said, Kaiser Kurios, which means Caesar is Lord, or Caesar is God. You cannot buy or sell unless you have that certificate. What do the Christians say? Jesus is Lord. You know the Caesar of the Christian story? Christmas story? He sent out messengers throughout the world with his missives. Those messengers were called evangelists. His messages were called gospels. He took the name Augustus. August, we got August, okay? Augustus means the divine, the revered. Caesar is God. Had to confess Caesar's God once a year. Jews couldn't do it, but Jews didn't have to. You know why? Centuries earlier with Julius Caesar, there was a civil war, and the Jews helped him. And they said, look, let's work something out. He said, what can I do for you since you helped me in the Civil War? They said, uh, don't force us to pray to you. We'll pray for you. We'll make sacrifices for you. He said, fine. He made Ju uh, Judaism an exempt religion. If you remember, all the early Christians were Jews. And they never considered themselves Christians. You know that? There are no Baptists or Assembly of God in the book of Acts. I looked and looked and looked. Not one, no Methodists, they were Jews. But when the Jewish synagogue denounced the Christians and repudiated them, kicking them out of the synagogue, then the Christians were expected to say, Caesar is Lord. Not every day, just once a year. And you can't buy and sell without it. And the Christians died rather than making that concession, because they said, no, Jesus is Lord. See, the original confession was loaded. If you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, what are you asking me to do? I'm calling on you, if you want to be saved, to make a public confession that Jesus is God. The Lord of Isaiah, the Lord of Moses, the Lord of uh, Jer Jeremiah, the Lord of Ezekiel. That Lord is the carpenter of Nazareth. You ever think about it? Jesus is a human name. Christ is a divine name. For unto us, what? A child is born. Amen? Amen. Well, what's the next line say? A son is given. Wait a minute. Is he born or given? Which is it? Both. The son says, 
I'm getting way off my notes, but I, I don't care anymore, all right? <laughs> the sun says in the Psalms, centuries before the original nativity, the sun says to the Father, you know the Psalms have conversations between, among the Godhead? The sun says to the Father, I know what you require. And it's not burnt offerings or sacrifices for sins. In other words, it's not concessions for the things I do wrong. What you want is one human life who never sins, who gives everything to you, who loves you in truth with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then it says in Psalm 40, the volume of the book is written to me. You've opened my ear. You've opened my ear. Literally, you pierced my ear. What's that talking about? Well, in the Bible, a pierced ear means that you're a servant that never, never wants his time to, to come to an end with the master. Servants had seven years, and then they were set free. But he said, I love my master so much. And, he, and they said, if you get to that point, and you put your ear on a, on a post, and they will pierce your ear. And that's a sign that you are a bond slave, a willing slave. Jesus said to the Father, I know what you want. I know what you require. I know I'm the one the book's talking about. Pierce my ear. And prepare a body for me. For I delight to do thy will. That's the son being given. And then we read about a child is born. And that's awesome too. I mean, Mary, for the first time in history, instead of looking up to God, she looks down and sees the face of God. Powerful stuff. What a faith. Back to Romans. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Really? You Christians are calling on me to say that Jesus is God? Now one thing you got to remember all of the early church was Jewish. And what is the cardinal doctrine of Judaism? Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Erkot. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. What's it take to get a monotheistic, I mean fervently monotheistic, pious, devotee, What's it going to take to get him to call a carpenter God? Nothing less than a, a resurrection. You ever think about that? Come back to Romans again. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, what? The dead? Why did God die? God died? That doesn't even sound right. How could God die? See, I told you, this is one line, but so loaded with divine revelation. What? This is one of the reasons why God had to become a man. Because a man can die. God can't die. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is God and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, why did he have to die? See, you could just keep plumbing and plumbing and plumbing. It's only two, two lines. That Jesus is God and that God raised him from the dead. Wait a minute, he died? Why did he have to die? How did he die? Well, he died a criminal's death. What? God died a cripple. Shut 
shocking. Shocking? More like offensive. Now you know why Paul was out of fellowship with the Christians. He hated them. He said at one point in his life, I thought to do everything I could in my power to contradict the name of Jesus. He'd go out of his way to blaspheme Jesus. He'd force other people to blaspheme. He'd torture Christians, make them blaspheme. He'd throw them in jail. Men in these cells, women in these cells. Kids, you're on your own. Breaking up churches, arresting people. <coughs> well, how are you going to get a guy like that? Why, why was he so offended? You're telling me the Messiah of Israel is a carpenter from Nazareth who was stripped naked and hung on a cross? Are you telling me that? Are you kidding? <laughs> he, couldn't, he didn't get it. Then one day the penny dropped. He's on his way to arrest Christians in Damascus. Let well, me you know everything ends in Damascus. <laughs> he saw a light so bright and a voice, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you persecute. And Jesus' worst enemy became his most ardent proponent. Jesus is God? <laughs> Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus whom you persecute. Hard for you to kick against the brick. Hmm? Just a little confession. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is God. Jesus is the Logos. 1 John 1, verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we've heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. Notice that he emphasizes the physical. We touched him. We, we felt him. We heard him. We ate with him. The apostles all said we ate with him. You read the uh, resurrection stories, and they're not as spiritual as you would hope. Jesus is not in a trance qu quoting weird poetry, okay? They get out of the ship, and Peter gets wet. He jumps into the water with his coat on. They swim to shore and drag the ship to shore. They count the fish. They're not spiritual fish. Jesus is cooking. Come on, are you hungry? Come and dine. Isn't that beautiful? Here, Peter, have some fish. Aren't you going to eat Jesus? Sure, I'll eat. And when he ate the fish, as I've told you before, you couldn't see the fish through his esophagus. Why? Because he's real. He's alive. Or like when they run down to the tomb, it says, Peter got there first. No, John got there first. He's younger. He got there first. Didn't go in. But Peter, it says, ducked his head and ran in. Why? Because you couldn't run through the wall. It's not a spiritual tomb. It's real. He would have bumped his head. It's like the cross. If you ran your hand up the cross, you'd have splinters. If the stone that was over the tomb would roll over your feet, you'd be a cast for weeks. It's a physical representation. They says they looked at the clothes and immediately believed. They saw something, and they believed. What? Well, Jesus Christ has come and remains in the flesh. Now, let me just close by just saying why this is so important and, and has to be emphasized so much and see because like I told you the Gnostics were redefining what it means to know God just as they are doing now the Gnostics now and one of the things they always do and this is what the devil wants to do I shall never tire of reminding you of this the devil always wants to spiritualize Jesus did you know that spiritual it's all spiritual 
seems higher. It's all spiritual. And the apostles always emphasize the physical. You could touch him. He says, Thomas, put your, put your hand right in my side. You had a scar so big you could put your hand in it? Oh, gosh. You reckon he still has those scars? Let me tell you something about those scars. Those are the only man-made things in heaven. The scars of Jesus. Now, I need those scars. Yeah. You know why? Because you're going to be scarred going through this sin-sick life. It's inevitable that you'll be hurt. And this is one of the beauties of the incarnation. His scars speak to your scars. He knows how you feel. I love that song. He walked where I walk. He lived where I stood. He stood where I stood. He understands. As Paul said, whoever wrote Hebrews, we don't have a high priest that can't be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. God just seems so far away, so remote, so distant. No, he doesn't. There's another thing that you haven't gone through that he hasn't gone through. He knows. He gets it. He fully tasted death in all its forms. Well, let me move along. Why is, why is the Antichrist want to spiritualize it? And God wants us to see that Christ came and remains in the flesh. I gave you one reason last week, because if you spiritualize something, then you can make anything seem like it. But here's another one. You got a spiritual Christ, like the New Age Christ. In fact, even the word Christ. I mean, the same old ancient teachings that are around today. Well, like for one is that Christ is not a name. It's a spiritual experience. Like you could be Christed. You could be Christed. You could be Christed. You could be Christed. I'll give you a great comp- proponent of that. Kenneth Copeland. Who in talking about the cross of Jesus once said, if I had the knowledge that Jesus had, I could have died on the cross too. See, that's an ancient heresy that's back called adoptionism that says that, remember his baptism? At the age of 30, the Spirit came upon Jesus. That's Christ. And then when he went to the cross, the Spirit lifted. He became what he was before. Adoptionism. He's just a normal, well, he's a spiritual human being with a lot of knowledge and became the Christ. See, what the Antichrist was to do is divide the name Christ from Jesus. Who is the liar? But he didn't deny that Jesus is the Christ. The, Christ. the only Christ. Now here's what... I told you I, I'm going to close, so I will. Look, here, here's what you get when you, when you have a spiritualized Jesus. Okay? How many here used to be Catholic? Yeah. So I was trained to be an older boy, so you go up at the front of the church, and they have a little box called the tabernacle with curtains. Behind that tabernacle is the wafer. When you go by it, you're supposed to genuflect. Keep going. I'm bowing down to a piece of bread. Wait a minute. Christ came in the flesh. They're going, no, 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 that's Christ. Okay. See, that shows that they're antichrist because they deny the incarnation. Christ has come and remains in the flesh. That's not Christ. Christ is seated at the right hand of God. New age movement. Everyone can be a Christ. Okay. Well, that's what people think that follow people like Todd Bentley or, or uh, Joseph Prince or Benny Hinn. He's a specially anointed man. Anointed, that means Christ. Anointed, Christ means the anointed one. So there's a lot of anointed ones. There's all kinds of new anointed. See, this is Antichrist. The spirit of Antichrist is permeating the Christian church now. 
We had one of these anointed ones, one of these antichrists, actually prayed for Trump and laid hands on him. Rodney Howard Brown, an antichrist, who claims a new anointing. Okay. See, what happens when you spiritualize Christ, see, and we already talked about this earlier, you know, the, the Christian life, he, God comes up with three tests. The essence of the Christian life, the fruit of the Christian life is you get righteousness and you get love and you get this affinity to truth. But if you've got a spiritual Christ, then all you have is a spiritual righteousness. What do I mean by that? Well, thousands of Christians still follow a man who left his wife for his secretary. But that's all right, because he's still anointed. He's still got the power. Well, how can they justify that? Because to them, righteousness isn't doing right. It's a spiritual status. Who you are in Christ. That's why John said, children, don't let anyone deceive you. you. Look it up on your own, 1 John 3. He that sins is of the devil. What? Isn't that a no-brainer? Not anymore. He that doeth righteous is righteous. He that sins is of the devil. Why do you have to, why do you have to remind them because they're confused, because the Gnostics have brought a new teaching. They brought a new Christ, and the fruit of the new Christ is spiritual righteousness, not real righteousness. In fact, they'll even go so far as to say, it doesn't matter what you do in your body. That won't hurt your relationship with God. That's just physical. You're spiritual. This is tremendously appealing. One of the big deceivers now is a guy from Asia named Joseph Prince, who says you should never feel guilty as a Christian. You should never admit your sin. You should never be convicted. If you're convicted, that's the devil, because you are the righteousness of God. What? Can you see where that'd be tremendously appealing to a backslidden generation? These people are antichrists. And if you got a spiritual Christ, you got spiritual love. You don't have to be committed to a flesh and blood church where you go through things with people, which is humbling, by the way. Live long enough with people, all your flaws are going to come out, all my flaws are going to come out. It's humbling, right? Anyone can be spiritual all by themselves. I love everyone in the world. Isn't that beautiful? But I have a question. Who do you actually love? Oh, I don't even go to church. Oh, you're beyond. We'll catch up with you, Holy One, someday. <laughs> Spiritual love? That's Antichrist. That comes from a spiritual Christ who gives you a spiritual righteousness, who fosters spiritual love and truth. Spiritual truth. What's the difference between spiritual truth and truth? Truth actually has content. <laughs> you can't be a Christian atheist. You're either one or the other, right? You can't be a Christian homosexual. The unrighteous won't inherit the kingdom of God. Oh, man, you're getting too narrow on me now. <laughs> Spiritualized truth. Truth isn't something as humble as a specific doctrine. Aren't we beyond doctrine? Be a spiritual Christ, spiritual love, spiritual righteousness, and spiritual truth. You don't have to commit to anything. You can follow any prophet, any leader, any teacher that comes down the road because it, everything's true. And if everything's true, nothing's true. If Christianity's everything, it's nothing. I prefer the Christ who came in the flesh. And his fruit, 
He calls on us to produce real righteousness. How? He gives us a hatred for sin in ourselves. We hate it. We go to war with it. That war might not even be over until the day he gets here. Someone says, Pastor, how long do we have to repent? Very simple, until the last bit of indwelling sin has gone from you. I think there's only three people in this church that got to that point. Okay. No, I'm just kidding. Nobody. Real righteousness. He that sinneth is of the devil. For this cause did the Son of God come into the world, that he might destroy the works of the devil. What works is he referring to? Sin. And I prefer real love, not spiritual love. I love everybody. Well, I can't love everybody. Only those within reach. But I better love you, and you better love me. Since I don't go to church anymore, they hurt me. Oh, they will hurt you. Because all God has to work with is sinners, of whom I'm chief, as far as I know. What's real love as opposed to spiritual? Spiritual love feels better. It's like drinking soda pop as opposed to water. Real love is cleansing, but it's not snazzy. I'm to will your good. I'm to try to govern my behavior to will your good. I'll, I'll deny myself something if I think it's hurtful to you, even if it's legal to me. I'm to humble myself and make it right with you if I hurt you. I'm to be open to that. That's love. Someone says, well, that's not as fun as spiritual love. <laughs> I've been to meetings where they have prophecies. The Lord is just holding you in his arms and just caressing your hair. And, I mean, you... Oh, oh. Where, where does this come from? I mean, this is evil. It's erotic, almost erotic. I'd never, I wrote a, a little booklet called Why I Would Never Send a Kid to IHOP, International House of Prayer. Why? Well, one of the reasons I gave is because they sing erotic love songs to Jesus. These are the Catholic mystics. It's going to corrupt your life. And especially if you're a man, it's going to make you like a woman. I mean, come on, man. This is evil. The apostles never talked that way about loving God. This is evil. This is of the Antichrist. The real love. You've never seen him, have you? But you love him. Well, what's that love based on? Revelation. I love Jesus. As soon as I heard about him, I knew he was real. And as soon as I heard what he did, I knew it was true. I love him. I've never seen him before. And finally, real truth. You got to commit to a doctrine, a revelation from God. And if you're born again, you will. And one of the signs of the, you're born again is you'll keep on going after it. It's called inward affinity. And Jesus said, when Pilate asked him, what is truth? He said, for this cause I came into the world to bear witness to the truth. He's the sure guide to the, what, what science and the rest of the world can't tell us, the spiritual world. He's a sure guide. I'll take his word. And then he said something so beautiful. All who are of the truth will hear my voice. Are you of the truth? Are you of the truth? Is there an inward affinity with the truth? Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this church and for my place in it and all of our place in each other's lives and for the faithfulness and love of your people, which is a real testimony, not only to me, but to people all over. And I thank you for your son who came and died for us. And whenever I talk about him, 
I hardly know where to start and I hardly know where to quit because you are so much, Jesus. Please breathe your breath of life on this sermon and on the hearts of these hearers. In Jesus' name, amen.